today what we're going to do is talk about sort of several different topics within genetics. Um, much, much of it's related to human genetics. Um, so one of the first things is, um, so how many, chrom how many pairs of chromosomes in a normal human body cell? 23 pairs, 46 chromosomes total. They come, as we know, in homologous pairs. But there's one special set of chromosomes <coughs> in humans that are called the sex chromosomes. And the sex chromosomes are not a homologous pair in males. Uh, and they're called the X and Y chromosome. So it's the, usually when we create a karyotype, we put them as the last pair of chromosomes. And there's two possible sex chromosomes that individuals can have, X chromosomes and Y chromosomes. The X chromosome just kind of looks like a normal chromosome that we typically would imagine. However, the Y chromosome is different. The Y chromosome is a very, very small section of DNA. So obviously, the X and Y are not homologous chromosomes. They don't match up. And this has some repercussions for any traits that are carried on the X chromosome. So males have an X and a Y chromosome. Females have two X chromosomes. <clears throat> so, if we imagine in meiosis, when females are producing egg cells, which sex chromosome can they give to the egg cell? X. Just an X. That's all they have, right? So every single egg cell is the same in terms of the sex chromosome. They all have an X in the egg cell. However, males, when they are producing sperm cells through meiosis, how do you think sperm cells differ? Yes, yeah, some have the X sex chromosome, others have the Y sex chromosome. Sperm cells, 50% of sperm cells are X sperm cells, 50% are Y sperm cells. So, which parent actually determines the sex of the child? Yeah, the, the father. It's the sperm cell that determines the sex of the child because sperm cells vary. Um, actually, when they do in vitro fertilization, they can sort sperm by X or Y sperm. And they can specifically use one or the other to fertilize the egg. And so they could ensure that a couple in in vitro fertilization is going to have a boy or a girl if they wish to choose. Uh, so it's the sperm cell that determines the sex of the, of the child. <clears throat> now, there are some characteristics, some traits that are carried on the sex chromosome. It, it's made of DNA, carries genetic information like any other chromosome, but because males only have one X chromosome, this has some implications. So especially with certain diseases. So with certain recessive alleles that are carried on the X chromosome, they are much more common in men than women. Because for women who have two X chromosomes, they have a better, so to have a recessive disease, how many, how many alleles for it did, do you typically have to have? Two. And that's true for women with sex linked disorders like color blindness or hemophilia. But if you only have one chromosome that's carrying that information, how many recessive alleles do you have to inherit? to get the disease, just one. So it's easier to inherit one than it is to inherit two. So typically, sex-linked disorders that are carried on the X chromosome are more common in men. And so some examples, color blindness, as you may know, is much more common in men than women. That is a sex-linked disorder. It's the gene, it's recessive. The genes for it are carried on the X chromosome. So we can make a, a Punnett square showing this. So here we have a father who has normal vision. So when we are doing this using a Punnett square, we, we typically write the two sex chromosomes. So male has an X and a Y. And then as sort of a subscript, we put which, gene, which allele he's carrying on that X chromosome. So he has the normal gene. 
on his X chromosome. His Y chromosome doesn't carry a gene for us, so we just leave it blank. The mother, in this case, she has two X chromosomes, and she's a carrier. She has one normal gene, one gene for color blindness. So she's heterozygous. If we set up a Punnett square, we put the mother's two sex chromosomes here, X big C, X little C, put the father's sex chromosomes here, X big C, Y, cross everything as we would normally. And what we end up with, obviously 50% of the children are males, that's why, and 50% are females. When we look at the actual genes for color blindness, half of the sons would get color blindness, the other half would not have it. Half of the daughters would not have any gene for it at all, and half would be carriers. Can a male be a carrier for color blindness? No, they either have it or they don't, because they're either going to have one recessive allele or one dominant allele. So sex-linked um, genes, sex-linked diseases are more common in females and females. All right, you're going to have to go back a couple slides here, because this is that slide we skipped over earlier. Has to do with linkage. So sex link traits are linked to the X chromosome, but we can say that different genes might be linked together. Um, so remember, in meiosis, chromosomes, homologous chromosomes get separated. And so if genes are found on the same chromosome, genes for different traits, they tend to be inherited together. Like if you think about like having red hair and freckles, two different characteristics, but oftentimes they are inherited together. We might say that they are linked. And they could be linked because they are coded for on the same chromosome. And so if you inherit that chromosome, you will have the traits that are on that chromosome. Now, the closer those genes are located on the individual chromosome, the more closely linked they are. So here's a chromosome, and so we know in meiosis, gametes are gonna end up with one of these chromosomes. Now, can, is there anything that could separate these two genes and unlink them? Or are they forever gonna be inherited together? Crossing over. When these chromosomes cross over, if crossing over happens right between those two genes, now they are no longer on the same homologous chromosome. They've been unlinked. So which genes are more likely to be unlinked? These genes or these genes? Yeah, the bigger the gap between those two alleles, the more likely they're going to get split in crossing over. So these genes are likely not to be split because there's very unlikely crossing over is going to happen and just happen to take place in this little space here between those two genes. So genes that are close are tightly linked, genes that are far apart are not. And obviously if they're on different chromosomes they're not linked at all. And so scientists have used this by it to map out where on a chromosome different traits are located by looking at how often do they, um, are they inherited together and how often do they uh, get separated. And so they've created maps of the chromosomes and we know which alleles, which characteristics are, are um, coded for in different parts of the chromosome. One thing that's often done as we are studying genetics is we can create pedigree charts. You guys studied this in seventh grade, so some of this is review, but we're gonna add some complexity to that. So what is a pedigree in your own words? What is this diagram? Kind of like a family tree, but it shows some more than just who's related, it shows what? It shows traits. Yeah, it shows who in the family tree had certain traits, certain characteristics. So we might make a family tree diagram or a pedigree diagram that traces color blindness.
throughout a family's history by looking at which individuals were colorblind and which weren't. And by looking at the patterns, by looking at who has certain characteristics and who does not, we can learn about the genetics of those. We can learn if it's a sex-linked trait. We can learn if it's dominant or if it's recessive by looking at how it was inherited and passed on through this family. So in, in seventh grade, we just use squares and circles. Squares for males, circles for females. We shaded in the symbol if they had whatever trait we were studying. What do you think these half shaded in? Carriers. Yeah, those are carriers. They're people that are heterozygous for whatever trait we're looking at. We can also show some more complexity using some different symbols. Okay, for example, um, Fraternal twins are shown using this, connected in this way. Identical twins this way. Sometimes you show um, if a woman's a carrier of a sex link by putting a little dot in the middle of the circle. So there's some, some variations there. And so we recognize by looking at a pedigree. If something is dominant, typically what we'll see is if you had a parent that had this trait and a parent that did not, we would expect um, that their offspring would have it. If it's a recessive trait, okay, it could show up even if it's not present in the parents, even if they don't have that phenotype. We can tell if something is sex linked if we see that it's more common in males. We can tell it's not sex-linked if males can pass that trait on to their sons, or if it's equally common in men or women. So all this information helps us to sort of build a picture of how this trait is inherited. So as the DNA is replicating and copying itself, Sometimes there are errors, and okay, we call these things mutations. They're changes to the genetic material. And if we change the genetic material, if we change the sequence of bases, then we can change the characteristics. Sometimes the characteristics can change in a beneficial way, sometimes in a harmful way. Sometimes it doesn't affect the phenotype in any way. So there's a couple types of mutations. Somatic cell mutations, or you might call them germ cell mutations. Somatic cells are body cells. So if a mutation happens, let's say, in my skin cell, would my children be affected by that? No, maybe my skin cells would. Maybe it would cause some sort of damage. But that's not going to be inherited in the next generation. Only when a mutation happens in a sex cell, in the gametes, will it actually be passed on to the next generation. So only changes in the gametes are passed on. There's two big categories of mutations, chromosomal mutations and um, DNA mutations. So a chromosomal mutation or alteration is when the actual whole chromosome has been changed in some way. A whole extra chromosome may have been added. A chromosome may have been missing. Chromosomes may have swapped pieces that are not homologous. These are chromosomal mutations. And obviously, if we're getting a whole extra chromosome or losing a chromosome, that can have major effects on the individual. So one of the most common types of chromosomal abnormalities is non-disjunction. This is when during meiosis, the chromosomes, chromosomes don't separate properly during anaphase one. Then instead of the two homologous chromosomes going to two different cells, 
they both go to one cell. And therefore, the gametes produced from that cell will have the improper number of chromosomes. So an example, the most common example of one of these chromosome mutations is Down syndrome. Down syndrome is caused by non-disjunction. And Down syndrome is when an individual has one extra 21st chromosome. So having one extra chromosome leads to, because chromosomes have many traits on them, they have many genes from many characteristics, having a whole extra chromosome ends up changing many things about an individual. So the collection of uh, changes to an individual caused by that extra 21st chromosome are what we call Down syndrome. There are other non-disjunction um, disorders that happen as well. Trisomy 13 is another one. Um, there are also several that involve the sex chromosomes. Kleinfelter syndrome is when a person uh, inherits two X chromosomes and a Y chromosome. And typically, um, this leads to infertility. This is a man who is infertile because of having this extra X chromosome. Right? And there's other factors that go along with that as well. Turner syndrome is when there's non-disjunction, but an individual ends up with just one X chromosome rather than two. And this is a female. Typically, they have delayed or um, puberty doesn't happen unless they get hormonal treatments. Uh, typically, they also would be infertile. Um, and there's some other typical characteristics that go along with that. So um, there are different types of non-disjunctions on different chromosomes that have different effects. There can be instances in which an organism inherits a whole extra set of chromosomes, and rather than its cells being diploid, the cells are triploid. Now, typically in humans, this doesn't happen and result in a viable pregnancy, but in plants and some other organisms, it can happen. Sometimes it's done on purpose to create different varieties of produce. Like see this watermelon with the oranges. Sometimes a whole section of one chromosome can be swapped with another non-homologous chromosome. That's called translocation. Here's an example of translocation where you have chromosome 4 and chromosome 20, and for some reason a piece breaks off of each of them and is swapped, <coughs> but they weren't homologous. This isn't crossing over because they're not homologous <coughs> chromosomes. So this leads to some, some changes. <coughs> here we see, we'll talk about karyotypes in a minute, but here's a karyotype showing an extra 21st chromosome resulting in Down syndrome. And all of these sort of um, physical effects are caused by having that extra 21st chromosome. Wait, like all of those have it, or all of those like could have it? Uh, no, so typically a person that has Down syndrome has pretty much all of these differences. Um, you know what this is? What's different about this character? Look at what's different about this karyotype. Two X's and one Y, that's Kleinfelter syndrome. So these pictures we're making, these are called karyotypes. They're basically a picture of a person's chromosomes. What they would do is they would take a sample of cells, they would sort of stop them, when they're in the process of mitosis so that the chromosomes are condensed. They would take a picture of it. And they used to do this by actually cutting out a photograph and like pasting all the chromosomes in order. They line them up from the longest chromosome to the shortest. Longest chromosomes of pair number one. The shortest are 22. And then they usually put the sex chromosomes as the last set and label them X, Y, or XX. And so you can tell some things by looking at one of these karyotypes. They're typically made, they can be made for a, a, a fetus by doing amniocentesis, taking some fetal cells and preparing a karyotype. And you can tell, obviously, the sex of the child by looking at the sex chromosomes. You could tell if there's any chromosome abnormalities 
you would be able to tell if they were going to have Down syndrome or trisomy 13 or, or any other chromosome disorders by doing this karyotype. So here we have normal karyotypes where you have 23 chromosomes and you have either XX female or XY male. Here again we have Kleinfelter syndrome. Here is Down syndrome, trisomy 21. And here is Turner syndrome, a missing Y chromosome. So there are other chromosome abnormalities you could detect using that. So those are all chromosome mutations, big changes to a whole chromosome. But there are also gene mutations. When individual bases in the DNA code are changed in some way. We call those gene mutations. And they can just happen sometimes, randomly. When the cell's copying itself, the cell does have some ways of correcting errors, but sometimes those don't work 100% of the time. And we have sort of three big categories of gene mutations. Insertion or addition, deletion, and substitution. And so sometimes one of these changes happens and it doesn't really have an effect on the phenotype. It could have happened in a section of DNA which actually is not a code for a certain protein. It could have happened and it didn't change the amino acid it's coded for. So sometimes they have no effect. Other times they might have a negative effect. They could cause some problem. Remember, DNA has the recipe for how to build the various proteins of it. So if we change the DNA, we change the protein. And that could have negative consequences. There are also things that could cause mutations to happen more frequently. Radiation especially is one of those. Exposure to x-rays, ultraviolet rays, this is why getting sunburns and uh, tanning are not good for us because we're exposing our skin to ultraviolet light, which can increase the chances of mutations. Also, certain chemicals can cause mutations. Okay, benzene, and PCBs, and formaldehyde, things like that. And so here we see a normal, let's say, DNA sequence. You have two codons, AGT and CGA. So sometimes a substitution mutation just changes one of those letters. It changed, in this case, the C to an A. And that could change the amino acid that it's coding for and affect the protein. Or we have insertion, where a T got inserted in between the A and the G. Or a deletion, where this C was deleted. Now, a substitution mutation affects one amino acid in the protein that it codes for. However, these mutations, because of the way our DNA code works, every three bases is a code for one amino acid. So if you insert one new amino acid in, or one new base in, it shifts everything forward one. And therefore, it can change many of the amino acids that go into the protein. So typically, we call those frame shift mutations. Typically, an insertion and deletion has a larger impact on the organism. It's like, it's like a the yeah, it depends where, yeah, where in the sequence as well. So some examples of albinism, okay? when a person has no pigment in their hair or skin or eyes, this is due to just one incorrect base in a person's DNA which leads to them having a lack of this pigment called melanin. Okay. So most of the time they're, they're damaging, but there are times when a mutation could be helpful, that it could result in some trait that provides a benefit to an organism, and then it would be favored through um, natural selection, like the peppered moths that we learned about. Okay. A mutation leading to a darker color could provide an advantage when you have a darker background. Why'd you put that picture? <laughs> because. Is that the vampire one? 
this is Paul. Uh, this no, is Paul. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. No, this is a Himalayan rabbit. So what we're talking about in these slides is, so our DNA, our genes, determine many of our traits. But there, our DNA does not determine everything. There is an interaction between outside influences and our DNA, which is important to understand. This is, for example, this is a Himalayan rabbit. So obviously its DNA controls its fur color. However, if you strap a ice pack onto this Himalayan rabbit, it oh, it's it's not it's beneath it starts to turn a dark color. It's like one of those it's like it's like the 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 yeah. yeah. Eventually it, it will go back after the, the ice pack's off, it will go back to white so after like a while. Cups. It doesn't happen instantly, it has to regrow, but this is an example of the outside temperature affecting the um, fur coloration of this rabbit. Uh, here are some plants that were grown under different color lights. So obviously, plants make chlorophyll based on their genes. Their DNA <coughs> has the code to make chlorophyll. But that gene is influenced by the environment. If there's not enough light, then there's less chlorophyll produced. So there is an interaction there. Identical twins. Do you guys know any? Do we have identical twins in our? Are they identical? Wait, there's a no, they're fraternal. Wait, they're fraternal. No, what? They're fraternal. Yeah, they are. But um, there are. So, if you knew identical twins, I think um, our Christopher and Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Christopher and Jeremy. Sixth grade, they switched class. Yeah, so Christopher, so whatever, identical twins. Eden and Elliot. Can you? Eden and Elliot. Can you tell identical <laughs> twins apart? Yeah, so you can tell, yeah, so you can tell identical twins apart because there are some slight differences. Now, our, our genes do control almost all of our outward appearance. However, there is some interaction with the environment that leads to identical twins being slightly different. In fact, scientists study identical twins a lot to learn about genetics. Because if we look at identical twins, in things that are different between them, we assume those are not controlled by our genes because identical twins have the exact same genes. So we can use that to um, understand which traits are genetic and which are influenced more by the environment. Grace? Did you see the thing where there was like triplets? Like these three guys, they didn't know each other? Oh, yeah, that's so sick. Like, but they came together, but it turns out it was like a study, so they forced it, and then one of the guys killed himself because Oh, I didn't see the actual thing. I just saw like the, the trail. So sometimes there are, so they study identical twins in different ways. Sometimes what they do is they study identical twins that were separated at birth and adopted by different families. So they are raised in different environments and they look at, okay, well, if we look at these two identical twins raised in different environments, which things do they have in common still and which things are different? Do they like the same foods, all the same foods? If they did, well, that would probably tell us our food preferences are genetic. If they like very different foods, that helps tell us, well, maybe it's how we're raised and the foods we're exposed to. So they can learn a lot by studying identical twins. Almost everything they like was like the same, like they like the same music. Oh, they really? The same. That's so weird. Yeah. That's so weird. All right, so a couple more slides about human genetic disorders. So, you know, most human traits that we think of are not just simply, they're not like, purple and white flowers in a pea plant. You can't just do a Punnett square of your parents' height and tell you what your height's going to be. That's not the way most human traits work. Mendel sort of got lucky when he was studying the pea plants that the traits he was looking at were either one or the other. They were dominant or recessive. Most traits are much more complicated. In humans, most traits are what we call polygenic. They are controlled by several <coughs> genes interacting as well as interactions with the environment. Do we have genes that control our height? Yes. But they, there are several genes which influence our height. Also, our, our genes may give us sort of a maximum height, but our diet at, when we're young, our stress levels, 
the environment we're raised in, all those things also influence our growth. So there's this combination of factors. Okay? And so here are a couple diseases, though. There are some diseases that are caused by just a single mutation, just one single gene. One of those is fetal ketonuria. This is a, a disease caused by a single recessive allele. So that means the person could be a carrier of this disease and not know it. And what it does is it interferes with an enzyme. So this, this um, disease, the person has um, the enzyme that breaks down a certain amino acid, phenylalanine, is not functioning properly. And so therefore, it builds up in their blood, and it can severely impair the development of the brain of an infant. And so they test for PKU. As soon as a, a baby's born, they do certain genetic tests, or blood tests, in which they see if it has, because if they catch this early, they can put the child on a very special diet, which they don't give them any of this amino acid, and therefore it won't build up in their body and cause these negative effects. So um, it can be caught early and, and um, they can tr be treated. Another is sickle cell disease. We'll learn a lot about this at the end of our unit. A sickle cell disease is a, um, a blood disease. It's caused again by a recessive gene. It's uh, more common in people of African descent. And there's a reason for that. It has, when a person is homozygous recessive, they have sickle cell disease. And uh, their blood cells, in low oxygen conditions, change shape into these sort of crescent-shaped cells. They don't carry enough oxygen. They build up in a person's blood, cause extreme pain. They can cause a whole host of health problems. Um, and so it's a pretty, it's a very bad disease in terms of living with it. Um, however, if a person's heterozygous, they don't have sickle cell disease, but being heterozygous gives them some resistance to malaria. And so it does have an advantage in certain situations when a person's heterozygous. Okay. And so um, there's no cure for it. People have to get common, uh, frequent blood transfusions and so forth. Um, so it's uh, a, another genetic disease. And then the last one we'll talk about, this is um, another disease, Tay-Sachs disease, is caused by recessive polio. And this leads to a person having an inability to, let, to make a certain enzyme that breaks down certain fats in the brain. And this leads to the deterioration of nervous tissue. Typically, this is most common in Jewish people of Central European descent. And um, people can carry the disease without knowing it. And if two carriers have children together, there is a 25% chance that their child would have the disease. It's caused by an insertion. Um, if you look at the gene for the allele for Tysax, Okay, we have the beginning of the gene is the same, but then we have an insertion. Our uh, gene was inserted here, and therefore everything else is shifted forward. And that leads to this um, enzyme not functioning properly. <coughs> Grace? Why is it most common? Yeah, so like why, uh, why is um, sickle cell disease most common in African descent? Or this disease most common in Jewish people of Central European descent? Typically it's because People in those groups would tend to marry people um, in the same sort of ethnic group, and therefore these sort of diseases um, start to become more common in those groups. Or like in the African descent with sickle cell disease, it provides an advantage to people living in areas that have a lot of malaria, and Africa is one of those places. Good question. <coughs>